Okay, so um, my name, as Jesse said, is Melissa Miner. I work at UC Santa Cruz, but I live remotely in Bellingham, Washington. And I work with a group called Marine, and that stands for the Multi-Agency Rocky Intertidal Network. And we are a consortium of a bunch of different groups who are all working together to collect long-term Rocky Intertidal monitoring data using the same methods so that we can compare those data up and down the coast from um, Alaska all the way down to Mexico. And we use these long-term monitoring data for a lot of reasons, um, some of which I've included here. Uh, we've, we've used them for assessing oil impacts from oil spills and climate change. And then the focus of um, tonight's talk is marine disease events. Um, so sea stars are the reason that we are here tonight. These are ochre stars um, pictured here. But in addition to sea stars, we also monitor um, kind of the key players in the rocky intertidal system. So things like mussels and rock weeds and barnacles. And there's a whole suite of things that we monitor either um, those species directly or the, the entire communities that are kind of created by those species. Um, but again, tonight we'll just focus on the sea stars. And um, just to point out, all of these dots are spots where we have long-term monitoring sites. Um, and those are spots where we go, with the exception of Mexico, we go back every single year and, um, and repeat these surveys so we get nice long-term data. And some of these have been going on, like some of the ones in Southern California, we've monitored for as long as 40 years. So some of these, these data sets are really long-term. Um, and these are the sites in Oregon. So most of these were set up in around 2000. So we have um, over 20 years of data now at, at all of these sites. Um, and they're kind of nicely spread out from um, E. coli in the north down to um, Burt Hill, which is right next to Brookings in the south. And um, there's, you know, a number of methods that we use for monitoring these various species, but again, since we're talking about sea stars tonight, I'll just focus on that. Um, so the, the way that we monitor sea stars is we go to a site and we find um, typically three areas that can be um, kind of variable in size and shape. Um, but what we're looking for are high densities of ochre stars. And that's, that's these guys pictured in the lower right. Um, those are the most common species of sea star in the, on the outer coast in the Rocky Intertidal. Um, so those are our primary target for our sea star plots, although we will count any sea star that occurs within these plots. We mark the boundaries of these plots with um, permanent bolts that we install, install in the rock. So we actually drill into the rock and epoxy those bolts in. So if you've been to some of our sites, you may have noticed these bolts. Um, and then we can stretch meter tapes around these bolts to delineate the boundaries. And that way we're coming back to this exactly the same area every single time. And that's really important because we're looking at how things change over time. And so we want to be monitoring exactly the same area to be able to assess that change. Um, and then for every ochre star that we find within the plot, we measure what we call the radius of the star. So the center of the star to the tip of the longest or straightest or whatever arm we can actually measure. Um, because sometimes they're, you know, shoved into deep into crevices. And what, um, what these data give us are, um, is the ability to look at patterns over time. So this top graph is showing sea star counts. These are ochre star counts, um, and that ranges from zero to 800. And then these are years across the bottom. So ranging from 2000 to um, 2022. I am gonna show you the more recent data um, in a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm keeping that secret just, just for a few minutes. Um, but what I want you to notice here is that this is sort of the normal we added an, an extra little bit here. That's what this, this jump is in numbers, but you can see numbers kind of bounce around over time. And then there's this dip, and that was due to sea star wasting syndrome, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the next few slides. 
um, this bottom panel is showing our size data. And so um, this is the same years from left to right. So this we didn't start measuring sizes until 2004. So that goes from 2004. Um, and the data showed go through 2013. And these bubbles represent the numbers of ochre stars in each size class. So we measure them in 10 millimeter bins. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Um, so that's what's shown here on the right axis is C star size. But basically the smallest ones are at the bottom, the biggest are at the top. And a normal situation is where you have the majority of the stars in your population, um, kind of in the 80 to 100 millimeter range for, um, for a radius. And, and that'll be um, obvious why that's more important a couple slides from now. So that dip that we saw in the, in the prior um, slide, that was due to C star wasting syndrome, which um, I'm sure most of you are at least somewhat familiar with um, since you're tuning in tonight. Um, I wish I had, you know, some new exciting um, news for you that, that to share that we figured out what the cause of sea star wasting is, um, but really we, we don't know. Um, it's this condition, sea star wasting syndrome, describes a general set of symptoms that are seen in many species of sea stars, and really the cause is still unknown. Um, there are hypotheses about what causes the disease, but there's nothing that that really makes sense on the, the broad scale that we're seeing it. So there have been um, lab experiments done, for example, that um, you know that that point to possible causes in that lab setting, but they don't necessarily make sense uh, in a place like the outer coast of Washington, where you've got you know, lots of waves and just very different conditions than, um, than a laboratory setting. So anyway, still very much unknown, um, although there are lots of people uh, looking into possible causes. Um, we know that there are at least 20 species of sea stars that are affected. Um, one of the interesting things about this disease is, is that the spread and emergence has been patchy and not linear like you'd expect with a pathogen where the disease would spread from, you know, from one area to the, the next adjacent area. Um, the first place that we saw the disease was actually on the outer coast of Washington. And then one of the next places was all the way down in California. And the Oregon coast was not really impacted until a an entire year after we first saw those those first sea stars on the outer coast of Washington that were impacted. So it's really, um, you know, that's that's yet another kind of confusing piece to this sea star wasting syndrome story. There are um, researchers who feel like temperature is important. Again, on that really broad scale, there isn't one temperature metric that seems to kind of explain that, that pattern of disease emergence and impact that we've seen. Um, but it does seem like temperature anomalies might be important. And so what I mean by that is, um, for example, in winter months, um, the water still may be cold compared to summer months, but, but months that are um, anomalously high compared to the normal for winter, those sometimes are periods where we see um, an emergence or re-emergence of sea star wasting disease in some areas. So that seems like it could be important. Um, people who are studying, and I'm I'm not a um, I'm not a I, I'm an ecologist. I'm not studying um, the cause of sea star wasting, just how it impacts populations in the field. But those who are studying it. Um, are currently focusing on the microbiome. So that's the viruses and bacteria that actually live on the sea stars um, and trying to figure out which are associated with sick stars and how other factors like temperature and um, water, pH and oxygen might contribute to uh, the development of these sea star wasting sy symptoms. Um, and then um, 
Another important piece is that this, this particular event has persisted in the system since 2013. So we're going on nine years now. And although the, the really big impacts were in those early years, 2013, 2014, that's when we saw mass mortality and a lot of species up and down the coast, um, we have continued to see low levels of disease in almost all areas along the whole West Coast. And then um, it's kind of uh, cropped up again or flared up in places. Um, so again, these, these are all the pieces that we know at this point. There's still a lot of, a lot of questions to be answered. This is what sick sea stars look like in case you haven't seen them. So early signs of the disease um, include arm curling and stars can become kind of lethargic. Um, this can be followed by the development of lesions and tissue decay like we see here. Stars can drop arms and this seems to be a potential um, a way to try and rid themselves of the disease. So um, just because a star gets sick doesn't necessarily mean that it, it will die. And we, we are seeing um, more than, than I'd say typical animals who appear to have dropped arms and are healthy otherwise um, and might be growing back um, arms from those places where, where they lost um, or, or dropped uh, arms that were impacted by disease or affected by disease. If um, this isn't effective, then we then the disease can lead to individuals that look like this one that are um, heavily covered in lesions and tissue decay and, and arm loss. Um, and so this is what we saw on a broad scale in, um, in 2013, 2014 in, in lots of different areas. So as I said, just because a star gets infected by the disease, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to die. So we see evidence of lesions healing. And then um, here's an example of an individual that lost three arms and is growing them back, these little nubs. And sometimes more than one arm will grow back from a place where they've lost one arm. So we get ochre stars that now have um, six, seven, eight arms, or maybe just four arms. Um, so lots of lots more interesting looking stars than um, than we saw prior to the disease event. Okay, so here's that set of graphs again, and here's the most recent data. So again, here's that dip that we saw in population numbers that resulted from sea star wasting, and then you can see pretty quickly after that the population um, kind of skyrocketed. Uh, and was actually still, um, the numbers are higher than they were prior to the disease. And that's due to this large influx of small individuals. So remember these bubbles along the bottom represent numbers of stars in the smallest size classes. And so these big bulges down here at the bottom mean that we are counting lots of lots of little bitty stars. And the good news is, that means that this site is getting lots of recruitment and those recruits are growing up. So that's that movement of these, these bulges up into these larger size classes. But we're not quite back to the stage that we were prior to the disease event in, um, in 2014, where most of the animals are in that kind of 80 to 100 millimeter range. We just, we're not, we're not quite there yet, but things are generally looking good um, along the Oregon coast. And the same can be said for a lot of the Washington outer coast um, and parts of Northern California. I'm not gonna go into the whole, um, you know, all, all the patterns that we're seeing on the whole West coast, but just know that you guys in Oregon are in one of the best places for, for ochre star recovery at least. Um, we have sites in Southern California where we've seen virtually no recovery at all. Um, and I guess I should mention for those of you who don't know um, how, how at least some sea stars reproduce and that includes ochre stars, 
Uh, what I'm talking about when I say recruits is um, ochre stars, they do what's called broadcast spawning. So they release their gametes into the water. And if an egg is fertilized, then it can develop into um, a, a larva, which is a, a tiny, tiny microscopic sea star that doesn't look anything like a sea star that can float around in the water column. And then after a couple of weeks, that larva, if it gets to a spot where it, um, it feels like it's a good place to settle out, it will settle. And that can be far from where its, its parents um, are located. And so that's how we get recovery at these sites is recruitment of those larvae and settlement of those teeny tiny sea stars at these sites. So um, that was, you know, I forgot to mention even what site this was. So this is Bob Creek. This is one of our sites that I showed on the map um, just south of Newport. If you are interested in learning more about um, ochre stars or other work that we're doing in Oregon and elsewhere, you can go to our website and um, I'll give you more information about that at the end of the talk. Um, but if you go to this tab, um, site info, that will take you to um, the sidebar where you can select sites by region. And then you can select Oregon sites and you can see everything that's going on at our sites along the Oregon coast, or if you're just interested in ochre stars, you can look at sites by target species and select the ochre star. Okay, so those were our long-term monitoring sites, um, and that, that's part of that marine network. Um, when the sea star wasting disease um, began impacting large numbers of stars, we started getting a lot of requests from um, people from the general public and community science organizations who were wondering how they could contribute to this sea star monitoring effort and, and helping to assess impact from sea stars. And so we ended up partnering with a number of groups up and down the coast. And um, these are the sites that are now monitored, where sea stars only are now monitored by a number of different community science partners. So these groups are using the same methods that I showed earlier to monitor sea stars at all these additional sites. And most of these were set up around 2014, 2015. So after we'd seen um, those, those first die-offs from, from sea star wasting, some of them are, um, are even newer than that. Like this one, Short Sand, that was set up, I think just a month ago. I think, I think Jesse said that she helped with that one. Um, so anyway, I'll show you data from one of these so you can see what that looks like. Um, so this is, this is Yahats. So, and the reason I picked this one is because this is one that is, um, that I'm sure some of you who are tuned in have helped uh, collect these data because this was established by Oregon Coast Watch initially. And you can see, um, at this site, this is 2015, and this goes up to 2021. Um, numbers were pretty low initially when this site was established. And again, that's because there was pretty major loss due to sea star wasting, but we've seen pretty steady recovery over time. This is just numbers. We do have um, the size data available as well on the website if you're interested in that. And, um, and again, this is for ochre stars. Okay, and um, to find that, that information, so find these, um, these other um, groups that, that we're collaborating with, you can go to the website, um, click on related research and collaborative monitoring, and that will take you to um, kind of a similar page where you can look at sites to, to our long-term monitoring page where you can find sites by region and um, see all the groups that are monitoring sea stars in Oregon. Okay, so I'm gonna take a minute to, or maybe a few minutes or a lot of minutes to answer some questions now, because this next part of the talk, I'm gonna um, be introducing resources that you can, um, you can find on our website and how to 
submit um, observations of sea stars if that's something that you'd like to do. So I'm fine with people unmuting themselves. I can look and see if there's anything in the chat. Looks like Dennis has a question. So Dennis, I will unmute you. Okay, you're allowed to talk. Thanks for being here, Dennis. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I just wondering, this is um, one type of sea star. Do you have similar data for the, um, what is it, sun star um, or sunflower sun star, sea stars? Because uh, that's the one that's really kind of so critical to the uh, kelp beds. Yeah, so I, I was going to mention that at the end of the talk, that, that that is a really important star to keep track of. Our marine network is um, is just just focused on rocky intertidal systems. And so sunflower stars, they, you know, you, you can't, or at least you used to be able to find them in rocky intertidal systems, but they're pretty rare. And you have to have a really good tide um, for the most part to, to, to see sunflower stars. They are mainly a subtidal species. And so we definitely work with groups who, um, who are, you know, more focused on sunflower stars, but because they're so rare in the intertidal zone, it's not one that is a, a big focus for our group. Um, but for this, the sea star observation log that I'm about to, uh, to give some instructions on, you know, how to fill that out, if that's something that you're interested in doing, there's a spot for recording um, observations of sunflower stars. And so that that's actually been really useful. And it's one of the many data sets that um, that some researchers at Oregon State University used to kind of compile um, and assess the, the impact that the disease has had on sunflower stars. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Um... So we have a number of questions in the chat and we have another hand raised. So I'm gonna to go to one of the questions in the chat and then we'll head over to you, Mark. Um, so Molly asks, do larvae get sea star wasting syndrome? That's a good question. And I know there's been a little bit of research into that and everything that I've heard um, suggests that the answer is no. But again, because we don't know what the cause of the disease is, I think it's hard to say anything um, definitively. So I, I would say a tentative no, but um, I think there's still a lot to learn about, you know, what, what the cause of the disease is. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and she had one more part to her question. What expected species of sea stars would we see in Clatsop County beaches? Probably you're talking intertidal or intertidal and subtidal, but. Yeah, so in the intertidal and, and the reason that we target ochre stars um, is because that is by far the most common species. Um, you'll also see six arm stars left to Sirius. Um, Jesse had a really nice picture of a Henrisha, the blood star, though you, you'll find those in the intertidal. Um, there's occasional, you know, there's, there's other species and that's one of the things that we have on our um, website is identification guides for most of the common, the species that you would commonly find in the intertidal and, and also the subtitle because we do have some groups that are um, contributing subtitle data to this effort. So, and, and one of the nice things, so there are a lot of good identification guides out there for adult sea stars, but we also include tips for distinguishing juveniles of, of all the species that, um, that are kind of the, the common ones that you'll see. And that's important because there are species that the adults are pretty easy to tell apart, like ochre stars and six arm stars. Um, the adults of ochre stars are much larger than, than six arm stars. But when they're juveniles, it's really hard to tell them apart. And you can't, you know, like I said, you can't go on um, arm number alone because six arm stars might have five arms or ochre stars could have six arms or, you know, or more or less. So 
um, I, I would suggest checking out our, um, our identification guides that we've got. We also have uh, examples of what Sea Star Wasting looks like on the website. Um, and I can show you how to find those as well. I highly recommend these ID guides. They are excellent. Marine is the place to go to look at these and to learn more about them. So definitely go there. Okay, Mark, you are next and I've allowed you to talk. Hi there, enjoy your presentation very much. So my question is, um, I have a group of about 40 or 50 of us that have been going out for, let's see, we're almost two and a half years now doing Sea Star counts just south of San Francisco on some really rocky um, terrain, tide pools. And um, I, mean, I was wondering if we could somehow find out about connecting with your group. Um, we do do it very scientifically and we are supported slightly by another uh, university, but um, and it, it, can we find out about you know, contributing to your group or joining? Yeah, um, yeah, let's connect by email and see if um, if what you're doing is, is, you know, if the methods will, will meld with, um, with kind of the standardized methods that we've developed. Are you working with um, San, people from San Francisco State by any chance? Yes. Okay, so probably focusing on left Sirius, the six arm star. No, they, we're just doing um, ochres and bat stars. Oh, okay, okay. The group that I know at, at San Francisco State, that was kind of one of their primary focuses. Um, because left Sirius, the six arm star, they are what are called brooders. So um, they are pretty much the opposite of of what I said about ochre stars and how they reproduce. They actually brood their babies right right underneath. So if you if you lift them up, um, you can see sometimes hundreds of little teeny tiny sea stars underneath. And um, and because of that, the the disease has uh, caused local. Um, researchers think that they've been, uh, they've gone locally extinct in some areas because all, all of the individuals were wiped out and they have such a hard time recruiting to, to new areas because they don't have that pelagic uh, period where their larvae are floating around. So um, anyway, yeah, let's, let's connect, um, you know, later this week, you can I, I, I think I have my information on this presentation later, but you can definitely find it all on the website as well. Uh, I can okay, it with you. thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your question. I'm wondering, Melissa, if um, if Mark's group would want to do the Sea Star observation log, if that would be helpful, if he's talking about that. So definitely check out this log because yeah. this would definitely be a way to contribute from my understanding, which is why we're here. So um, yeah. thank you. Um, okay, so there were some other, some more great questions in there. Um, Laura, hi, Laura. Do you want info from divers when we dive? Definitely, yeah. And that's, um, especially for, for sunflower stars, that's, that's some of our best information comes from divers who are, you know, going to the same spots repeatedly. We've got a group of divers up here in Washington that have been um, phenomenal in locating areas where sunflower stars are still relatively abundant. And that's been helpful both for helping us to, to kind of understand the, the patterns of disease emergence and then kind of retreat. And then also just having a place where researchers who are studying these organisms can find them because for, for some of these species, it's, um, you know, it's difficult to even find some of them anymore. So yeah, yeah. And I'll show you on this log when we go through that where you indicate that um, that your observation is from a dive. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, would love for you to join in. Okay, back to uh, hands raised, Hope. I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay. Hello. 
My question is about identifying the ochre sea stars. Is it by color, shape, or both? Um, I would say definitely not color. That can <laughs> that can help in some cases, but most sea stars can be highly variable in in color and kind of um, you know modeled patterns. Some of them. Um, so color can definitely, uh, it, it, it can, uh, it can be confusing. It, so having said that, there aren't many sea stars that are this same color as this, this ochre star shown here. But, um, you know, if, you, if you've spent some time out there, I'm sure you know that ochre stars can be purple or orange or you know, brown or some combination of that or gray. So color is not not a reliable um, a reliable thing to use for, for identifying sea stars. It's shape. So um, there's ochre stars are, are pretty distinct from most, well, from <laughs> at least in the intertidal from, from most other species. There is one other that can be easily confused. Um, up here where I am in the, the Salish Sea, Puget Sound region of Washington, um, called a mottled star. And it looks very similar in shape, but one of the things you look for is that the mottled star has kind of pinched arms at the, at the base of the star. And so these are things that are all described in the, um, the identification guides. Um, but yeah, there's a couple things when, uh, but I think the big thing for ochre stars is that they, these series of ossicles that are that are on them, that forms a star-shaped pattern in the center of these stars almost always. And even when they're bitty bitty, they've got a star-shaped pattern. It's um it's more of a pigment thing when they're that small than a um, than an ossicle thing. But that's that's the most distinctive. Um, characteristic for ochre stars. And again, that's described in our um, identification guide. Thank you. Thanks, Hope. Um, and speaking of patterns, we had another question about, and maybe you just mentioned it, but what are the white parts of the ochre sea stars, those raised parts, um, when they aren't on, the, on, the, on, on healthy stars? So not the wasting, but yeah, so we had a question come in. What are they called? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Let me back up and see. Oops, my computer has frozen. Um, I just want to see if I've got a picture where I can show some of these things. So um, let's see. This one might be better. It doesn't show it great, but so these are, this is that star shape pattern that I was talking about, and that is pretty distinctive of ochre stars. The ossicles are, um, they're sort of like the skeleton for the star, and sea stars are, are pretty remarkable organisms. They, their skeleton is super flexible. So um, one of the things I did as an undergraduate is I was doing an experiment with sea stars where we tried to cage them. And it was pretty much impossible. They can squeeze through tiny, tiny holes because their whole body can be, um, you know, kind of, it, it can conform to pretty much whatever shape they need to get through. Um, so it's a, it's their skeletal system um, that kind of gives them structure, but it's, um, it's extremely flexible. So it's a, it's a good thing to have when you're trying to conform to different um, rock surfaces and tuck away in a crevice and, um, you know, all the different things that, that sea stars do. And then the other white thing that I wanted to point out, but I'm not, it's just not showing up super well on here. Um, you can see it on this one. So this is tissue decay here, but this white thing here is what's called a madreporite. And um, this is the, the way that sea stars bring water into their, um, into their system. And, and that's kind of how they get their structure is they, they are fluid filled. So that's kind of their water exchange system or, or valve. Um, 
And it's important to point that out. We actually, early in the, um, when the disease was cropping up, someone said, every single one of the stars at my site has exactly one lesion in the middle. And so, it, you know, <laughs> that, that was, that was the madreporite. Um, so that, that's just an important thing to, to point out and know that they, they all have that one white, white dot there in the middle or sort of off, off center. It's very cool. Okay. Um, so Bernadette asks, is there a location in Bandon doing measurements? There's. Yeah, so um, I don't think, let me see what the closest one. We have a, a monitoring site at Bandon, but it's not one that we come to every single year. It's, we have another set of protocols that are called our biodiversity protocols, and those are much more intensive. And so we do them on kind of a five to 10 year rotating cycle. And um, so Coquille Point is one of those sites, but again, we're not there every year. Um, so yeah, we've got, we don't have anything that's consistently being done at Bandon. That would be a great site to do observations. And now that it's a newly designated marine garden um, on the Oregon coast, I think it's the eighth one and it's new. They're at Face Rock at Kakil Point. It would be a wonderful um, place to um, start a group of some dedicated sea star observers. That would be great. Thanks for that question. Okay, another question from Molly. And she's got a couple, which is cool. So. Can citizen science help with the Ecola State Park long-term monitoring site, summer 2022? Is there a long-term monitoring site there? We do, yeah. So that is one that um, that's kind of co-sampled by my group at UC Santa Cruz and Olympic National Park. Um, and it's because it's, it's part of or, or close to um, to the, the national park there. Um, it's the, the Lewis and Clark National Park. So it's, it's more of a historical park than a, um, right. you know, than, than a, a nature, <laughs> nature focused park. Um, but so it's a little, I guess that what I'm trying to say is the politics are a little bit complicated for that one because there's already a couple of us who are coordinating to get the monitoring done there. Um, in general, because those, those methods are, um, you know, we're, we're doing lots of things in addition to the sea stars and there's, um, especially at that site, there's really kind of a, a time crunch because the, the place where we do our monitoring is, um, kind of out toward the end of, of the point. And so we have to cross through some, some surge channels to get out there. So, um, right, so that's not site. an ideal, not yeah, an ideal not, citizen science site. It's not a great <laughs> site to to um, be training people. We just don't typically have a lot of extra time there. So that was kind of a long answer to probably not. Although, um, you know, that I want to emphasize that we're only there once a year. And so that, if that's a place where people are going to regularly, it would be great to get more information um, on a regular basis. The other thing about that area is the Haystack Rock Awareness Program, which is, you know, just basically right next door. They do have a citizen science program. And so they would be a group that if you were interested in um, doing that, that more, those more intensive surveys, you could reach out and I'm sure that they would love to have volunteers. Yes. And so this is the sea star observation log from my understanding is the alternative. So there are these, these long-term monitoring sites that are pretty much set. They have scientists coming to them. They have researchers coming to them, but there aren't, as you saw, there aren't a lot, but there are a lot more, a lot of rocks. There are a lot of rocky habitats or a lot of intertidal areas where, um, that aren't being observed at all. And that's where, uh, that's where you all come in. And so, um, 
Here's another interesting and good question from Molly. If we participate in the CSTAR observation log, can we include size classes for non-permanent plots and track the total search effort using your instructions and long-term site protocols? Um, yes, I, so <laughs> it's, as, as Jesse said, there are, you know, there, there are these two main protocols. There's um, the really intensive um, monitoring the same area, measuring all the stars, and we're pretty, there's a couple things we like to do for those. If possible, we like to work directly with the groups to, to train people so that things are being done in exactly the same way. So we know the data are, are um, exactly comparable. Um, and then the, the kind of the other end of the spectrum are these observation logs. And those in my mind are much more fun. You're not dedicating yourself to, you know, potentially hours and hours of crawling around in the, the seaweed and looking in under crevices and, you know, sometimes going out there at four in the morning when the tide is low. So, and this is something that you can do anywhere and you can do it every single week or you can do it once a year. And so it just doesn't have the same constraints that are associated with the, the more intensive surveys. So I guess my suggestion is if that's something that you think you're really interested in, try to get involved with one of the community science groups that's doing this work already. And, um, you know, and, and just make sure that, that that's something that, that you really would want to commit to for, for forever, basically. I mean, as long as you can do it. And I think that's, that's the other piece that, um, that can be challenging for people to, to go back repeatedly year after year after year after year. Um, so again, this, this is, the logs are um, what I tend to steer people toward, but if that's something that, you know, you feel like you just need more than, then um, we can try and connect you with one of the community science groups that's, that's doing this work already. And Molly took place and um, took, took part in the recent uh, long-term, brand new long-term monitoring site and um, at C Cape Falcon. Great. And she's a teacher and her, her kid, she's an amazing teacher, amazing science teacher and did a, has been doing a really great job with their students um, making their own guides. Uh, so we should connect, I, I think Molly and you should connect and cause I think that she might, she might be wanting to do a really quality job out there, so. All right, that yeah. sounds good. Yeah. Okay. What time are we at? Yeah. I'm thinking maybe we should get through um, some of these online resources in case people have questions about those. So um, I am going to try this link and you can let me know if this works. So can everybody see the website now? Not yet. That might, are you clicking on here? It's not, oh, you, you might have to um, stop share and okay. then switch your screen okay. or just switch screens. We'll do that. Okay, can you see the website now? Yep. Okay, perfect. So this is, um, this is the Marine website and you can get there by either, um, searching for or typing in pacificrockingertitle.org or if you're interested in just sea stars you can go to seastarwasting.org it they're they're both um linked together so if you find one you can find the other but this is where you go to find all of these resources that i was talking about so um we've got um all of our identification guides are here so We've got examples of symptoms of the disease in ochre stars. This juvenile sea star identification guide is great for those little bitty guides. Um, this one probably isn't as useful for, for you folks down in Oregon because it's the modeled star, which tends to be pretty rare where you are. And then this one, this examples of mild and severe symptoms, this has a lot of different species. So it gives um, examples of what the disease looks like, but it also gives a lot of um, tips for identifying species. And the same thing for the juvenile sea star identification guide. It gives tips for identifying both adults and um, juveniles. 
And I'm not going to show those just because we're we're getting a little short on time. I want to um, to go back and go through the, the observation log. Um, but just know that there's a lot of other information in here. There's um, a list of species affected. Again, here's that link to the collaborative monitoring groups. Um, for a while, we were doing a good job providing updates. I think it's been a little while since we've done this. Um, and then this sea star map, this is where all of those observations that you submit go to. And I'll, I'll show that at the end. So if you want to submit an observation, you click on that link and you um, there's a little description here of, um, you know, of, of things we're looking for. You click on the this link here, this takes you to the log. And we'll just go through one of these together. Because some people, um, you know, there's a couple of things that, that re we require that are different from like an iNaturalist type um, platform, which is pretty simple. It's, it's basically, you know, just submitting a photo. And um, if you can ID things, great. If not, there's a whole team of, or a whole, you know, lots of people who are, who are helping with that. Um, we, we have set the bar a, a little bit higher, I guess, is, I don't know if that's quite the right way to word it, but there's just some, some basic information that we need to be able to, to use these data, and, but they're not, they're not hard to get. And so I'll just walk you through how to do all of that. So this first question, if you've never, if this is a new location, um, you would click no. If it's a spot that you're going to repeatedly, you only have to fill out some of this information, the, um, this, the latitude and longitude information. Um, you only have to fill that out one time. So that's when you would click yes, as if you're going back repeatedly. So let's just do a pretend observation. Let's say we were out today. It's nice to choose the date from the, this calendar rather than try and type it in yourself because we need it to be in this specific format. And so the calendar will, will let you do that. Um, site location, let's just do um, Coquille. Oops. Point, since we were talking about that one. And if you have other information about the site, you can um, put that in there. That's in Oregon. So you just click the location. And then this is um, the step I think that that some people find challenging, but we've got instructions, right? There's a link right here for how to get um, latitude and longitude coordinates from Google Maps. Um, so Coquille Point, um, I looked it up earlier, 43.11, and we're looking for decimal degrees here, which I think is the default on Google Maps, but if not, you can, you can make it the default. Um, and then the longitude minus one, two, four, point four, three, seven, one. And that's plenty of, I think Google Maps gives you a whole string of digits, but this is, that's plenty. Uh-oh, I'm going to plug in my computer. There we go. <laughs> um, okay, and then location type. So this is... Um, the person who asked earlier about whether we're interested in um, in observations from from scuba dives, definitely you would click subtitle here. Um, I'll put Rocky in her title, but if you were doing a dive, you can um, give us information about how deep you were here. And then this is where we get down into the species and whether or not they were observed to be healthy or sick. Um, so let's just say that we saw a sick sea star at um, Coquille Point. We would say yes. If everything that you saw looked healthy, you would select no. And we'll say that that, that um, individual that we saw was an ochre star, Pisaster Cratius. We do ask that people um, use the Latin names here rather than the common names. And the reason that we do that is because there can be multiple common names for a single species, so it can get confusing. 
But again, all of these are included in our identification guides. Okay, and then here's, um, here's an example, or I, I wanna walk you through what you do if you don't see a species. So we do have people sometimes, this is the sunflower star, Pycnopodia. I didn't see those, you click no. But what this is asking is, was this species observed and was it healthy? Yes or no? And so if you didn't see it, you, you want to click species not observed. So likely that we didn't see these other species. So I'm going to put species not observed for all of these. Um, and this is urchin. So urchins is another, the, the purple urchin is another species that we have seen um, lesions and balding. We don't know if it's the same disease or something different. They, they are known to be affected by a couple different diseases, um, but it's one that we're watching out for. So if we saw urchins and they all looked healthy, we can say no. And then this is a list of other species that you might see. Um, so other species, were they, did you see um, symptoms of the disease? If you didn't see any of these that, um, that were diseased, then you don't click anything. And then here's that same list of species. And if you saw these and they were healthy, so say we saw a blood star and Henricia and a leptosterius, the six arm star, and those were both healthy, you check those boxes. And then this last bit is just your name. So Melissa and then Niner. My affiliation. If you don't have it in affiliation, you don't have to put anything in here. And then your email address. And this is so that we can contact you um, if we have questions. And then you can send photos if you're not sure about um, a species ID or if a, an organism or if an animal was sick or healthy, you can send us pictures. And if they're good quality pictures, we can usually um, let you know what species it is and, and whether or not um, something that you saw that, that might be questionable. Um, oftentimes we can tell from the photo, not always. So I won't be sending any photos. And then if there's any other information, so the type of stuff that is great to get in here, um, if you see other sea star species that aren't included on that list, you can list them here. Or if you have counts and you really want to put them in there, you can you can put them in here, and um, and we do store that information. Um, the other um, another type of information that's really valuable is. Um, say you came to your favorite beach that you walk on a couple times a week and there were sea stars washed up on the sand, but there were all there was also a big storm last week and large swells. We know that that's, um, those, those types of disturbance events can dislodge sea stars. And so um, that's really valuable to have because these sea stars may not have died from wasting disease, it may have been just from getting dislodged by these large swells and getting washed up on the beach. So that was the sort of information that you can put in there. And then you just click Submit Sea Star Observation Log. And then that will take you to, I'm going to show my last few slides. Um, share. Okay, we're back at the beginning. Um, okay, and so then once you, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, can you guys see that now? Go, um, go to your slideshow and do. Yeah, I, do a current slide. I, okay, it was just it was going slow. Yeah. Okay. There Does we that go. look good now? Okay. Yeah, so I know tiny. this font is really <laughs> tiny, but this is what we do with those data that are submitted through the observation log. Um, each of these points on here are um, sites where where people or multiple people have um, submitted observation logs. And so this one's for Yahats Beach. Um, and you can see the 
um, the date when the site was last, when the observation was last submitted, and then the date when the disease was first observed, the species affected, and then the species that appeared to be healthy. And then you get a list of, um, of all the observers who have submitted observations. And if you click on that site observation history, and I know this is all really small, I'm sorry, but it's, you can um, go and do it on your, your uh, computer at home. But this is the list of all the observations that were submitted for that site, all the species that were affected, all the species that have been observed to not be affected, whether or not the disease was present. And so, um, you know, this is kind of a, a fun way to contribute. And these data get used uh, for things like looking at patterns of, or looking for possible patterns of disease emergence and, and impact. Um, and I think, you know, Molly, for your high school students, this might be kind of a fun way to contribute because they can actually see their names there associated with observations. Melissa. All right. And the, can yeah. I ask a question real quick? Was that so? Is this a mixture of the long-term monitoring and the sea star observation observation forms? What you're showing us right here for Yahat, or is that just long-term? It it is no. This is a mixture. So it's mainly cool. observation okay. logs, but because we're out there, you know, on the days that um, that we're doing those long-term monitoring surveys, it, it makes sense to, to put the what we see on those days in this log as well. So yeah, it's it's mostly observations from um, from community members, but it also includes those long term um, the kind of a summary from our, our long term monitoring um, as well. Very cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've talked about this a, a little bit already, the sunflower star um, again, this is one of the species that has been most heavily impacted by wasting disease. Um, a group of researchers um, who, uh, who are uh, largely out of Oregon State University estimated that there's been a um, more than 97% decline um, throughout the um, sunflower stars range. And the, that decline has been most severe from Oregon to Mexico, so in the more southern part of its range. So again, if, if you see these guys, it would be really great. Um, you know, if you submit no other observation, uh, it would be great to, to get these in that system so we have a record of it. Um, and that's all I have. And here's those two websites again. And um, my email, if, if people want to, um, connect with me directly is cmminer at ucsc.edu, but you can find it. I'm, I'm all over the website, so you can find it on, on here as well.